Mark, it's over to the supreme god of music, Tom York. Hello, Jimmy. <laughs> this year, we released our new album, In Rainbows. Can you tell me... Can you tell me... Can the panel tell me what was special about that? That was good, wasn't it? That's brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me all. Wow. How brilliant is that? And everything's in its right place, so we're good to start. Welcome to Trimming Musical Fat. I'm Stephen Nicholson. And I'm Paul Nicholson. And today we're delighted you're joining us for our second What If episode, where we write on alternative history for a musical artist we love to create what we hope is a great additional album in their catalogue. And the subject of this episode is alternative rock trailblazers, Radiohead. And joining us today to help choose the songs that will make the Alternative History Radiohead album is Ross Braidwood and Davey Mellon. How are you guys? Uh, not too bad, not too bad. I was uh, just running around the park today and it made me smile a bit, so I guess you could say I'm fitter, up here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. all, all Good. Who is tasting uh, you, Davy? I, I, <laughs> I do hope the quality of your jokes improved during the, the pod, Davy. <laughs> and, and we should say in advance that uh, Davy, uh, one, does not have two. It sounds like he does because he's coughing a lot. <laughs> and three, um, we hope he makes it through this, uh, this pod alive. <laughs> Keeping my fingers crossed. Uh, and what about you, Ross? Uh, all good, Alan. Yeah, yeah, all good. Um, Thursday, Friday, tomorrow. So, yeah, in good mood. Absolutely. Okay, well, gents, thanks for joining. Let's take a trip back in time. 
Radiohead are not typically a very nostalgic group, so when the band opts to put out unreleased material from their archives, it's usually worth your attention. Their game-changing 2000 album Kid A reached its 20th anniversary last year, while its 2001 follow-up Amnesiac hit that same anniversary this year. The albums were actually recorded at the same time and were at one point considered for release as a double album. Now the band is finally making good on that idea with a new three-disc set called Kid Amnesia. This package pairs both the Kid A and Amnesiac albums together officially for the first time, then adds a third disc of unreleased material and alternate takes from the same sessions. The set will be available as a 3-CD edition, as well as a 3-LP edition for vinyl fans. So guys, the scenario we're giving ourselves today is that Radiohead, who have been spending a few years recording the follow-up to their classic album, OK Computer, decide to release only one album from these tracks in the year 2000 as opposed to two. So one in 2000 and another in 2001. So what material can we select? Well, we're drawing from the 10 tracks on 2000's Kid A, the 11 tracks from 2001's Amnesiac. We're not going to include any B-sides or alternate versions, and we're not including any additional cuts from the forthcoming Kid A Amnesia release. Rather bizarrely, this uh, release is coinciding with this episode, uh, which is a very convenient coincidence. Uh, and I personally can't wait to get my hands on the, the, the vinyl version of uh, Kiddy Amnesia. Uh, so we're going to call our version of the album Amnesia Kid. It would be remiss of us to start creating Amnesiac Kid before first talking about the two albums Radiohead actually did release in 2000 and 2001. So let's start talking about Kid A. Could Kid A and Amnesiac, could it have been the Radiohead double album? Could it have been all 23 tracks? Yeah, but it, I, whether we were ready to be that bold then and release a double double yeah. album, I think that that required, you know, you've got to have a lot, you know, a lot of confidence. And I think it that... It would have watered everything down yeah, on Kid A, certainly. That's right. And certainly the, the impact of the... the there's a great story that one of our one of our managers, Bryce, says that when they first played it to the, to the publishing company, the and we just re-signed <laughs> with them, and they're expecting like you know guitars, for, and so you know the first song, everything's the right place, not a guitar. The second song, uh, Kid A, not a guitar. No, the, the third song, National Anthem, not, a, not guitar. a guitar, and they're literally sweating. You know, it, it, the impact of the record was was that much great. So Kid A was widely anticipated. Spin described it as the most anticipated rock record since Nirvana's In Utero in 1993. According to Andrew Harrison, then editor of Q Journalists, 
expect it to provide more of the rousing, cathartic lots of guitar Saturday night at Glastonbury, Glastonbury big feature rock moments, OK Computer. Months before its release, Melody Maker wrote, if there's one band that promises to return rock to us, it's Radiohead. After Kid A had been played for critics, many bemoaned the lack of guitar, obscured vocals and unconventional song structures. And some called the album a commercial suicide note. The Guardian wrote of the muted electronic hums, pulses and tones, predicting that it would confuse listeners. Mojo wrote that upon first listen, Kid A is just awful. And in a departure from industry practice, Radiohead released no singles or music videos for this album, conducted few interviews and photo shoots. Instead, they became one of the first major acts to use the internet as a promotional tool. Kid A was made available to stream and was promoted with short animated films featuring music and artwork. Bootlegs of early performances were shared on, on file sharing services and the album was leaked before its release. In 2000, Radiohead toured Europe, a custom-built tent without corporate logos. I couldn't actually get the worldwide sales for this, but certainly in the UK it sold 404,000 copies. It uh, reached number one in the UK and the US and it achieved platinum status in both countries. And it sold 404,000 copies. Okay, so what do you think about that, hearing some of those things, guys? Well, we were surprised in the, um, the album sales, going from the bands to OK Computer musically. That was a bit of a difference. And then I suppose there's a bit of difference there, but I, I think it's closer to OK Computer than <laughs> OK Computer is to the band. So I uh, you a bit surprised. I thought it, it would probably have sold more than that. Um, but it'd be interesting to find out how, what sold in America, because I know that uh, Redhead have always done pretty well in America, I think, when it comes to the album sales. I think uh, America's had about 200,000 in its first week or something. Was it? Uh, Certainly, yeah. the, I think yeah, it was the first the album, uh, the album number one album there. Yeah, cause I think I think That's to right. give some context in America, Ra- Radiohead, OK Computer, only was it maybe a top twenty album in America. So this was a big step right. up for them to get a number mm-hmm. one. So let's talk about the our kind of thoughts overall on the Kiddie album. So maybe I'll start with with you, Davy. Um. I actually love it. Um, I used to listen to it all the time when it when it came out. It was uh, on constant play. It was one of these radioheads just listened to it a couple of times and just forgot about it and then maybe listened to a couple of singles. Um, no, I used to listen to it all the time, to be fair. Yeah, okay, big fan. Ross? I probably came to it a wee bit later um, and uh, I probably bought, I think I bought after I bought In Rainbow, so fairly later on coming to it, but in terms of the album itself, I mean, it's it's clearly a bit more experimental, but I've always kind of liked experimental music, so for me, after I said it two or three times, I love the album. It's got its, got its pure tracks in it, but as an album goes, it's, it would definitely be up there as one of their best. Okay. Aye, because I think um, it was definitely a, not the guitar music that you expected from them from their previous three albums, so it was definitely a, a move away from that, but once you got used to it, it was like, you know, that's pretty good. Okay, uh, thanks, Paul. What about you? The first time I heard the album was last week, so uh, <laughs> and I wasn't really that familiar. I was, wasn't really that familiar with uh, these two albums that we're going to talk about, but, you know, I like Radiohead and big fan of OK Computer and didn't think... <laughs> much of it uh i really liked the track national anthem mm. and what i did it reminded me a bit of david bowie's uh berlin period when he did low and heroes mm. it sounded a bit like some of that experimental music that he did on the synthesizers mm. and stuff so it sounded a bit like that and I, a bit for me. me it just didn't work really a bit too yeah almost avant-garde Mm-hmm. But like too too smart for its own good to sound good. That's just my opinion. Yeah, yeah. Rolling Rolling Stone magazine's got it at number twenty in like the five hundred greatest albums of all time. <laughs> number twenty last year. 
number 20. I'd love to see the list, like, but... Uh... <laughs> okay, no. Well, have they got Kenny G at number one? <laughs> uh, well, Not for sure. me... Should I hit 20? Yeah. For, for, for me, it's a good album. And I'm, I'm so glad you actually said that, Davey, because it's a good album, but I think it's one of the most overrated of all time. <laughs> all right. and, I, and I say that as a Radiohead fan. And I'm supposed to give you some context as to why I think that. Uh, I'll, I'll explain. So in 1997, Radiohead released one of the greatest albums of all time, OK Computer. And it's also one of my all-time favourite albums. It was when it came out and it still is all these years later. Before that, in 1995, they'd released the excellent Ben's album. And in that time period, 95 to 97, they released lots of excellent B-sides as well. So you then have this three-year wait for the OK Computer follow-up. It's shrouded in mystery. There's no singles released from it. The promotion is very low-key. Uh, the reviews, I remember when it came out, were almost overwhelmingly, gushingly positive. It's apparently a game-changer for guitar and music bands, and, I, and I'm so excited. I then buy the album the day it comes out uh, on my lunch break. I go out and buy it, and I then have to wait five agonizing hours to finish my work day to go home and play it on CD. So I get home, finally I play it, and it's about, what, 40, 45 minutes long, and after it's finished, I think, Three great songs, two trackies, and five decent to good songs on it. I was, uh, I just thought it was a crushing disappointment. Now, I grew to like it more, and I do like it more now, um, and it is a good album, and fair play to them for pushing the envelope musically, and, and don't get me wrong, yes, I do like it, and I think the sequencing of the second side of the album is spot on, uh, it feels as one, uh, and all the songs mesh really well together and segue into each other very nicely, but like most of Radiohead's post-OK computer output, I just find it incredibly patchy. I think it's good, it's not great. And I wanted a great album. So, there we are. Would you reckon there's been a great album since OK Computer? Um, I would say to you, in terms of their albums, post-OK Computer, the two best ones for me are In Rainbows and the most recent one, uh, Moonshaped. I always keep getting the title of it wrong. Moonshape Pool. Oh, mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I'm big fans of those two albums. So they ha for me, they have done better work than Kitty and Amnesiac since. Um, okay, computer. But, so, yeah. It's, uh, so for me, when I think back, it's just, I always think of it as disappointment. But, you know, everybody's different. Everybody likes different things. And, and, but, uh, and I, I love bands experimenting and so on. But I just think there's a lot of stuff which is uh, filler, uh, which is why, and we'll talk about Amnesiac very shortly. But for me, this is why I always thought, why did you not release the tracks? Because they recorded all these at the same time. Why not just release one album? Because if they'd done one album, then that would have been a that would have been for I think for me their best post OK Computer album if they'd just done the best tracks uh, and done one album from this time period. Uh, so so I think it's a really so rather than two good albums or decent albums, they could have had one brilliant album, and I would have preferred that. That's just my opinion. I, I think they are guilty at times of the, the experimental side of things. Like you say, you're, you're right, it's just filler. I mean, they've got a few examples in other albums as well. Mm -hmm. And you're like, why, why is that one album? I mean, it's it's just, it's a, it's a piece of music, but it's, there's, it's just nothing really going on, you know? So, uh, yeah. yeah. But when they're good, they're good. Oh, when they're good, they're great. Well, yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, let's move on to 2001 and Amnesiac. I jumped in the river, what did I see?
about being trapped in one particular lock, like in your heart or in your head, mm -hmm. that you just can't get out of. Mm -hmm. It's exactly that sort of like, you know, the guy sitting in traffic. Like when you go drive back to London today, you'll see them all driving the other way, coming out of London. And just look at their faces, you know. It's like, can't get out of this. So, Paul, do you want to give us the stats? The Guardian titled its review, Relax, It's Nothing Like Kiddie. Some, some critics dismissed Amnesiac as a collection of Kiddie outtakes, a perception credited by the fact that Radiohead released it after Kiddie. Ryan Schieber wrote that the questionable sequencing of Amnesiac does little to hush the argument that the record is merely a thin veiled B sides compilation. According to Pitchfork writer Scott Plaginoff, the use of traditional singles and music videos, which Kid A had not used, created a sense of ordinariness and the impression that Radiohead had bowed to pressure from the record label. The sales for the album in, in the UK, it was only able to get the UK sales, were 279,000, so uh, quite a wee bit down from the previous album, which was 404,000 copies. And it uh, reached number one in the UK and number two in the US. It went platinum in both countries, as the previous album did. It actually debuted at number two in the US with sales of 231,000, surpassing the Kiddie sales of 207,000 worldwide in its first week. By October 2008, Amnesiac had sold 900,000 copies worldwide. Okay. Mm. Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, so I'll maybe kick us off uh, talking about uh, Amnesiac then. So for, for me, it was great to get this so quickly after Kiddie. And I'd heard a number of songs when I seen the band play in Glasgow, uh, Glasgow Green during 2000. And I do remember that night that Knives Out really stood out. Uh, obviously, that hadn't been released at that point. So it was great to finally get it uh, when the album came out. Anyway, this was going to be the album that Kiddie should have been for me, right? So it was going to be chock full of guitars and normal songs, and <laughs> then I played it. And for me, it's it's another good, if, again, another patchy album. I think there's three to four great tunes on it. Yes, there is more guitar. Yes, it is a bit more traditional sounding than Kiddie, but ugh, yeah, it's, it's good, not great. Um, I just think of things like, did we really need another version of Morning Bell? And what, what I found quite amusing going back to these albums is that, uh, and listening to them again, is Kiddie has actually went up in my estimation in the last 20 years, and Amnesiac went the other way, which is quite interesting. So I think in summary, it sounds like I'm hating on both albums, but I do like them. I've just dropped 40 quid on the upcoming vinyl re-release, so I must like them. Um, but but uh, yeah, I, I, I think back to myself back then, I, I, I was disappointed. So that, that's probably just the hangover uh, from that. Uh, so Ross, what about Amnesiac? All right, so for myself, um, I remember buying the bands and then probably not really getting into the uh, OK computer. And I, I think it was, it must have been obviously after Amnesia came out. I remember buying it on 10 inch vinyl, uh, more than, I suppose more than novelty, more than anything else. So that was it. So I had it there and I remember listening to it and my, I just couldn't get in the album. I just felt it was the most depressing album of all time. <laughs> Uh, which uh, all in all, uh, nobody no be so surprised that I say. And um, <laughs> I think as time's gone on, I've kind of maybe quite the opposite of self, Stephen, in that that I appreciate more. I do think it's a patchy album. There's start, there's more filler on that than there is on Kiddie uh, and some of other other albums. Um, but there's that. It, but there's, there's, there seems to be a gloom about the songs. I don't know what it is. A bit of gloom, gloom to them. And some of it, some of it works. Some of it probably doesn't work. But I think when it comes to Radiohead, I mean, they've ex I mean, it's an experimental period, but it's good to see bands do that rather than just churning out the same stuff, stuff all the time. And I think looking back on these two albums, it's uh, maybe not their best, but 
fair play for them actually uh, completely rewriting how a, 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 I suppose our rock band should be. So, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you, yeah. Ross. Davy, what about you? Uh, I think if I think if these albums came out today, you'd probably wouldn't spend too much time uh, listening to the songs that you don't like on it. <laughs> you'd probably yeah. just skip skip over them. But um, because it came back out in the uh, what two thousand one, uh, you just spend quite a lot of time listening to it. And I'd say that you're right. What you're saying, it's a a bit patchy to to say the least. But there's some great songs on there, and there's some just. In- interesting, I would say. I wouldn't go too bad and say they were terrible. I would say they were interesting <laughs> for the concepts they were coming up with. And it was, again, it was different from anything else that was going out at that time. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, David. Last but not least, Paul, what do you think of Amnesia? Can you see them as, as like, I suppose it's kind of like what we're doing today, but I used to kind of see them as one album. Mm. Uh, I think there's a lot of similarities with them. I, I didn't actually realise that these were recorded at the same time. So that, that explains maybe why. And uh, no, I mean, Pyramid Song for me was the best song on the on the album. But they just sound very similar. It's just really, I think, like classic Radiohead, you had a mixture of, yeah, they do have the mournful song. <laughs> <laughs> That's an understatement, but you had like uh, upbeat songs as well, and it just sounds, it just sounds like it's too experimental. Okay. Yeah, um. Okay. Thanks for that. Uh, so, guys, maybe before we move on from it, uh, what's your favourite songs from each album? So, Ross. So, as in, which what's your favourite song from Kiddy and what's your favourite song from Amnesiac? That's a good question, Stephen. Give me a second. Uh, aye, so, well, it's quite easy for K- K- oh, across both both albums, but on Kiddy as well as Idiotech, that would be my favourite. For me, that's like their, um, when it comes to their experimental type music, that's for me is their absolute peak, I would say, absolute best song. Okay. Uh, amazing life. Um, and Amnesiac would be. Pyramid song would be my favorite. Pyramid song, yeah, and I'm music. Okay, uh, Paul. Yeah, I would say pyramid song for Amnesiac and Kitty. I quite like the national anthem. Okay, and Davy. Um, Kitty would definitely be the the national anthem, and probably I might be wrong for uh, Amnesiac. Between that and uh, Life in a Glass House. Mm. And you know when you said I might be wrong, you are, Davey. (laughs) Because the best song in Amnesiac is Knives Out. (laughs) So that's my favourite from that one. Kiddie. Yeah, National Anthem is my favourite song from Kiddie. Absolutely brilliant song. Okay, gents, thank you for that. So I'm optimistic we can do this. It's time to pick the tracks for Amnesiac Kid. So that is making it on to our album is one that's been picked by myself, Ross and Davey. And it is Everything in Its Right Place. That was everything in its right place. So, Paul, I'm going to come to you first. What do you, you, you never picked it. I'm obviously not a fan of the song. No, I just thought the album, the first two tracks were pretty poor, to be honest. Uh, yeah, just what well, was just. <laughs> <laughs> not a fan, okay. 
10 seconds of silence. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it, was like a, it was like a sponsored silence. I don't like it, so I'm not talking. Uh, Davey, you, you picked it. What do you like about it? No, I like how it um, just builds up and up until it gets, gets to its uh, conclusion. Then it just starts off quite simplistic. Um, but it just builds layer upon layer until you get the end. Um, reminds me of um, is it Vanilla Sky, is it? The yes. Tom Cruise mm-hmm. walking through Times Square with nobody in it. Yeah, and that's yeah, playing yeah. over the that's playing over the soundtrack and thought that was a really cool song to use mm. use, use for is that. It well. already, really, is that okay? Yeah. 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 yeah, it was a good soundtrack actually. Okay, uh Ross? Yeah, I, well, it's obviously it's the opening track on on Kiddy. Um and I can kind of see why it was a kind of opening track because it's got that that opening sort of keyboard line. Um, mm. you know, so <laughs> straight away, it's does it feel as if it's a rock band? So straight away, it's a different sound. Um, and I see, ah, I like see David said that it just kind of builds and builds. It's quite a euphoric song actually towards the end. More upbeat. Yeah. You know, mood, yeah. Uh, the song, then melody, uh, then compared to some other stuff on the best, definitely. Obviously, we, we sang it quite a lot at the, at the Transmit concert as well. Uh, but we, 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 we did sing this very heartily, Ross, at the concert a couple <laughs> of years did. back. Uh, well, I'll give you a, a couple of facts for the song. So, lead singer Tom York wrote this. About how he felt after a show on the band's '97 OK Computer tour. Uh, so the show was in Birmingham in England, uh, and when York came off the stage, he went to his dressing room and felt completely burned out. Uh, the band was becoming famous, but York was feeling helpless and victimised. Uh, and the line "Yesterday I woke up sucking a lemon" refers to the face you make because of a lemon's taste. Uh, and during the OK. Uh, okay, computer tour, York worked, walked around a lot of a sour face. And David, you mentioned Vanilla Sky, which starred Tom Cruise and Penelope Cruz. Uh, I think it was Penelope Cruz says she loved that line, and they were so glad to use that uh, song in the soundtrack, the, the sucking lemon uh, line there. Uh, for me, yeah, it's a brilliant song. When I first heard it, I, I was kind of waiting on the band and the drums coming in as it, as, it go, as it was going on and on, and it just didn't happen, which was a brave choice, actually, to keep it simple like they did. Um, and I think the song benefits from it. The live version's brilliant, but the best version I have ever heard of this is this one, which is when um, it was performed at the, the Transmit Festival in 2017. <laughs> Was it? Yeah, uh, yeah, this was the best version. I'm <laughs> gonna play it right now. <laughs> Definitely the best version as performed by <laughs> podcast guest Ross Braidwood. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> they're getting royalties for that royal is you'll get jail time for that you'll get jail time for that Ross it sounds a bit more upbeat Ross actually <laughs> <laughs> that's good that's good I think uh, like you sound everybody like you're enjoying yourself well, <laughs> well, I was enjoying myself I had a few pints by then uh, I think we can safely safely hear that a few a few shandies had been consumed by that point <laughs> <laughs> and wines, and wines, and wines, yeah, and gosh, the, can, we, can we just drop a plug in for the toll booth bar? Yeah. <laughs> just right, two I... double vodkas and coke for less than five. Yeah, <laughs> if, if you want to go, if you want to go to a Radiohead concert and not remember it, that's the bar for you. <laughs> hey, Davy, <laughs> and it's not spewing off the gear. <laughs> <laughs> so there we go. It was. Uh, yeah, happy memories from that show, that's for sure. So, Everything in, in Its Right Place gets the first spot. The second song to get a place on the album is the National Anthem.
that was a national anthem. I'll maybe kick us off on uh, this one. So, as I said before, this is my favourite song from the album and probably my favourite song spread across the two albums. Love it. I think the rhythm section's uh, groove with all the other instru- instruments and the sound effects swooping in makes it a real uh, oral delight. Uh, I think it's very jazz in a lot of ways with those trumpets that feature and it builds up incredibly well and when it's played live it is absolutely sensational and uh quite a fact for you uh the the bass riff that plays throughout the song is based on a riff lead singer tom york came up with at the age of 16 and the original title for the song was uh, everyone and you will find that the the song's title of national anthem is not mentioned at all in the lyrics but you do hear a bit of uh, our very own British National Anthem playing towards the end, very, very briefly. So, Ross, what do you think of the National Anthem? Yeah, brilliant. Uh, brilliant song. Um, what I quite like about it, uh, I suppose for my own track listener, I had this as my first song, um, is it's, uh, I think it's 1 minute 30, so there's a bit of a, a really big intro. And I quite like songs that have actually got a bit of an intro and then the vocals come in. Um and you see, uh, it's quite jazz. It's got the trumpet, saxophone coming in. So I suppose musically, it's quite adventurous. Uh, and yeah. the guitar as well, the sort of the dirty uh, sort of guitar groove, uh, guitar riff in it as well. Um, yeah, definitely one of the best songs on the album. He's Brilliant. Davey? Yeah, it is absolutely outstanding in my uh, point of view. I think... Um, if you were just a casual radio fan, I think uh, if you just heard that, I don't think you would even know it was Radiohead until you heard uh, Tom York coming in there. You would just like, what is that? But the experimentation that they've done on it, um, the layers and layers of things they've dubbed over, dubbed onto it, and using the sort of like jazz fusion band at the end of it, it's just, oh, it's like, absolutely incredible. And uh, just listen to that. Um, that uh, Jules Holland clip you sent to me today and yeah. seeing, seeing the live jazz band doing that, it's like, oh my God, it's yeah. incredible. Superb, superb. Uh, Paul, you're also a fan? Yeah, really good. good. The funkiness of it and it kind of reminds me a wee bit of uh, maybe you two, Acton Baby, uh, like Zoo Station or something. I don't know, just the, the groove of it. But it's a good song, and I do like the jazz bit as well. At the, at the, is that a surprise? Because I actually liked one of the songs on the album. Uh, yeah, I got the jazz bit at the end as well. And... There's a couple mm-hmm. of tracks I actually like the jazz, jazz bit. So yeah, it's good. There's actually a lot of jazz influences across both albums. Yeah, um, yeah. Agree. Agree. Yeah. 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 When you, you listen back to them now, you can actually hear that a lot. Maybe more so on Amnesiac than this album, but yeah, you can definitely feel the the influence of it. Okay, we'll move on to the next song that gets on to the album, and that is uh, that has been picked by myself, Paul, and Davy again. That's how to disappear completely. How to disappear completely. Paul, you didn't pick it. What, what, what do you not like about it? I, I did pick it. <laughs> you, you didn't. <laughs> she was I've, I've got here in the I've got here in oh, the you did. Apologies. <laughs> Apologies. I think it was me, Stephen. Ross. Ross it didn't me. pick it. Yes. How what? Ross. Okay, I take it back, Paul. My my yeah, my, you should, you should my, be my, of yourself. my scorn, 
My scorn. <laughs> Apologies accepted, Captain. <laughs> My scorn is now aimed at Ross when we get round to it. So, Ross, <laughs> why did you not pick this? <laughs> well, this was the one. So, when I, when I listen to both albums and kind of take the best of both, I took seven in songs from Kiddy. I kind of went with the approach of five from each each album. So, this was Borderline. So, it was, this was another song as well that, that contemplated but didn't make it. So, it was very close to, to actually being on the, on the, the, the final cut. Um, it's quite a beautiful song actually it's just one of these things I had to make a decision and that, unfortunately this is the one that I had to drop it sounds like uh, you're a manager who's had to sack somebody to, <laughs> to, <laughs> to bring down the numbers in the office <laughs> I had to make a tough decision <laughs> and unfortunately I had to let that song go <laughs> <laughs> I don't accept your apology Ross <laughs> Good enough. <laughs> speak, speak to my lawyer. <laughs> uh, Davey. Oh, that, that's generally one of the the really good songs on the album. It's it is, uh, isn't re- it, Davey? Re- really atmospheric. Um, <laughs> it, as again, it's when he sold it builds up and up, and I just like the the screeching at the end. I don't know if it's like some sort of violin that's been put through a tape deck the wrong way or something like that, but. <laughs> No, I just love it. It's Tom York's voice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Paul, you, yeah, you, you you did select it. What do you like about it? The, the sort of uh, reminds me a bit like the Velvet Underground. So the instrumentation in the background. I actually think a lot of these songs are better. Singles, to be honest, I think if you just admire the pieces of music probably better than as like a, a band's album. Uh, so yeah, that's me. It's... Yeah. Um, what about so, you? Well, some of the, what's quite interesting is the background to the song. So some of, some of the lyrics were inspired by a conversation <laughs> Tom York had with uh, Michael Stipe of R.E.M. Uh, where I think Tom York had been suffering from uh, depress- depression and Michael Stipe had suggested he deal with his issues by just pulling the shutters down and saying, I'm not here, this is not happening. So that's how that made its way into the song. And uh, But yeah, I remember when I first heard that album and played this song, it was just, oh, an acoustic guitar, an orchestra, a traditional song structure, way hey. Um, so I've always been a big fan of this song I think it's a beautiful song the strings in it are great as are Tom York's vocals and Colin Greenwood's bass on it Uh, the middle eight is great as well where it talks about uh, strobe light uh, where the strings rise Uh, I think David you've mentioned it but I love that phasing in and out of the strings near the end it's like Mm. a nightmare uh, going on yeah it goes crazy, yeah. <laughs> oh, well, maybe we'll do a version of that the next time we see Radiohead live, Davey. <laughs> the crowd will love it. Uh, but, but that's great before it returns to the kind of acoustic and simple strings. So, yeah, great, great stuff. Big fan of this song. Okay, next song to, to make it, which uh, I think I was the only one not to pick it, even though I think it's a good song. Uh, this one is Optimistic. Okay, that was optimistic. Davey, maybe start with you this time. You picked it. What do you like about it? Yeah, it's um, probably one of the only tracks in the album that sounds like a traditional Radiohead song. Mm. And you've got the you've got the guitars out there getting um, <coughs> getting played for the first time really on the album. Um, <coughs> sorry, uh, no, I, I, it's a really great song. <laughs> <laughs> Davy, are you optimistic you'll make it to the end of this recording? I'm going. I'm going to play it to my boss tomorrow when he, he asks when I'm four and six. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, 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 to be fair, I think you you might just get away with it. Uh, Ross, what do you like about optimistic? 
Uh, well, I think David, David, so you've touched on it. It's um, it's quite a, a sort of straightforward, sort of conventional sit track, and for me, it doesn't probably belong in terms of style wise on Kitty or or I mean, he's maybe more of OK computer, maybe potentially help with the So it certainly feels like a more traditional um, radio head song. Um, one of the strongest songs on Kiddy, and I suppose this was probably the one that it was either between that or how to disappear completely. I think it's between the two songs I was going to pick, so uh, a difficult decision. But yeah, cracking song, and the band, yeah, feel as if it's a band playing as opposed to maybe almost like a Tom York solo album. Mm. Um, yep. And it's got the funky outro at the end, which is good. So going back to the jazz thing, it's got mm. that sort of jazz wig out at the end, which I really like. And uh, yeah. yeah, it's a fantastic song. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, it's a good show. Uh, but the end of the song, yeah, the wee wig out at the end is really good. Uh, Paul, what about you? I think it's it's, it's a decent song. It's, it's, it's more like, like what? More traditional radio songs that I can to more. Uh, I was just going to finish, but no, it is quite ironic given the title uh, that it's a Radiohead title because it's so. Un- <laughs> the music, uh, but maybe that song is being a bit more optimistic. So, what are you try to uh, say, Paul? It's quite a funny title. Ironic. What are you try to say, Paul? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, I, I didn't select it, but it's not because I don't like it. It was just that I, I liked uh, other songs more. Um, so I remember, when, again, when I first heard the album, it was like, oh, you, hello, there's an electric guitar. <laughs> Yay. Uh, so, yeah, this was obviously the side, the side to start two of Kiddy. And as I have mentioned already, I think the side two of the album works extremely well. Um, all the songs work with each other. Uh, it almost feels like a medley of tracks on side two. Uh, so yeah, good song. Uh, I like the line, the best you can is good enough. And with, with that, um, Tom York revealed in 2003 that the song's chorus, where you can try the best you can, you, you can try the best you can, the best you can is good enough, came from words of encouragement he received from his partner of the time, Rachel Lowen, uh, because he was worried that what he was doing during the recording sessions for the albums was, uh, wasn't was releasable, thought it was rubbish. So that's where that came from. So the next song that gets on is, again, from Kiddy, and it's Idiotech. Let us give it a listen. I said coming, I said coming Let me both sides, let me both sides, let me both I said coming, I said coming Throw it in the fire, throw it in the fire, throw it in the fire When I scare monger in This is really happening, happening when Was Idiotech and Ross, this was your favourite song from Kiddy, so let's uh, let's maybe go to you first. Yeah, bro, yeah, I get, get, get I guess I think I previously said it, but in terms of their more experimental type music, this is, seems to just get it, just get it right, just get the right balance right between the guitars and the electronic, the drum beats, um, the drum machines. Um, yeah, be, be, based, yeah, based on Kiddy, based across both albums, I would say. And uh, one of the best tracks ever, and uh, then the live version as well. On I might be wrong, it's pretty tasty as well. Yeah, uh, so I, and I think it is a life. It's been a life favorite over the years. I'm not sure if they played it at trans, but I think they did. I can't even mind. I think they did. Yeah, I'm pretty sure they did. I think they did. Fantastic song. I uh, love the lyrics as well. Women and children first, and I uh, uh, just have just a wrong song. That's. It had been described by Tom York as the, the happiest song they've ever written, which I'm yeah. guessing he's being sarcastic because <laughs> uh, the song is meant to, I think that it's meant to be about somebody who's in a bunker yeah. during what appears to be an apocalypse. So, <laughs> uh, and idiotech is actually not a real word. 
uh, just in case you didn't know that. But yeah, I, I like the drums and bass on this. Uh, but the best part of the song is watching Tom York sing it live. Mm-hmm. Especially the bit Ice Age coming when he has like you know an epileptic. Fit. Uh, yeah. <laughs> this is the song to watch out for if you want to see him do his crazy dancing. Uh, and, and and that main riff in the song, uh, I believe that's actually a sample of a seventies um, uh, experimental type album. So uh, yeah, I believe so. I believe so. Yeah, Davy, uh, it's one of the songs to hear live. It's uh, truly comes into its own. Uh, and it's live version when he's shaking about the stage, but all of it. Um, what was what, what is the instrument on it that's uh, it's like kind of like a pheromone um, that you can hear him using at the start? I can't remember what it's called, but the way they they got played that, it's all just you don't hear that a lot in uh, yeah pop alt rock music. No, <laughs> and it's, like, uh, it's like it's like something from a sci fi movie, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, I, exactly. Totally. Yeah, de- definitely something different for them. That's for sure. Uh, now, uh, Paul didn't pick this. Unfortunately, we've lost Paul somewhere. <laughs> Where do you think he's gone, guys? <laughs> is, it, is it the old thing that his um, charger's run out? His uh, run? It, might, it might be. Who knows? But anyway, well, we shall, we shall plow on without him, without Paul, and we'll see how we go on. So the next song that gets on is Morning Bell. Let's give it a listen. I think, Davy, you didn't pick this one. Explain yourself, sir. Um, purely uh, just time reasons, I think. Um, I think once I'd cut down to all my, the songs that I wanted on the album, I was still about 20 minutes over, so <laughs> I had to look at both the morning bells and decide to cut both of them. <laughs> right. I think, okay. uh, if, I think uh, if Alan Partridge was to um, review this song, I think it would say, be about um, being a parent and how the kids can really annoy you and you just want to cut them in half. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, with, with, with this thing, Tom York um, had recorded it onto a mini disc player but lost the song um, when I think his mini disc got zapped but in a lightning storm or something and five months later he woke up after a long flight somewhere and remembered the song. <laughs> Which is rather bizarre, but yeah, I mean, for me, it's a good song. It's, it's kind of, I like its low kind of key production on it, uh, and the drums before the the all the band and the guitars kick in before the song's middle eight, and it's got a really good vocal from Tom York. Uh, Ross, you like this one? I do yeah, I, I do prefer it to the to the amnesia version. Yeah, it was it's a good song. Um, and again, towards the end, it's quite. A, it's got a sort of euphoric sort of feel towards the end, um, so you always kind of like the, the, these sort of elements in the in the song. Um, yeah, one of the strong songs, strongest songs in the album again. Um, and what I, I yeah up there with one of their best. Yeah, yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, it wouldn't let me back in, so I went into Google Chrome instead. That got me. All out. right. Yeah. So well, sorry about that. That's all right. You're just in time to talk about uh, Morning Bell. Yeah, that's a good song. <laughs> <laughs> okay, our... thanks. thanks for that insightful commentary into <laughs> the song Morning Bell. So we'll move on to the next song that makes it, which is the final track from Kitty, or final proper song from Kitty, which is Motion Picture Soundtrack. So I'm going to play that right now. It's another cheery one. We're all gathered here today to think about it. <laughs> Lord is my shepherd. You've mastered that on the keyboard piano. <laughs> I know. Do you like that? I'll, I'll put the Radiohead version on there. Stop. Oh, 
was motion picture soundtrack, and Ross, you did not pick this song. Yeah, hi. Um, it didn't make my short list either, I'm afraid. Uh, I mean, it's, 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 I suppose it's, it's fine enough. But I suppose it's just a bit modelling for me. Mm. Um, feels as if it didn't really go anywhere. And okay. uh, yeah, so just okay song, but definitely not one of their strongest on the album or, or any other cattle. But cattle. Okay. Uh, well, did you know that Radiohead started writing this song all the way back in 1987, uh, around about the same time as uh, Creep, and they first <coughs> performed uh, in 1996 uh, live. And uh, as it be- went on to the recorded version in Kiddy, uh, the song Lost a Verse and underwent major changes uh, by the time it made the album. Uh, but for me, yeah, it's a nice chill tune to end the album. And, and funnily enough, uh, it just popped up randomly uh, in the Amazon Prime show, uh, Nine Perfect Strangers, in the final episode, uh, mm. which was really quite bizarre. Um, and I think the reason that they were using it, uh, I think because you've got this wonderful use of the harp in the song, which gives it an ethereal uh, quality, which is why I'm sure they used it in that episode. And I think you've also got angelic backing vocals. I don't know if it's a choir vocals or a keyboard effect about two minutes in uh, and it has a nice little middle eight as well but two and a half minutes in there um and actually on revisiting it i didn't realize how short the song is it's quite a short song but yeah very good song uh paul yeah it's a good good way to finish the album and it's quite yeah you can, it's funny this is motion picture soundtrack and you can imagine it playing in a movie actually and mm-hmm. it's like you were saying they used it in in that show so yeah, no, I think it's quite a good way, and, and like I say, the, a lot of the music's on on the albums is good. It's just as songs, I don't think they're they're really as good as other, their other stuff previously. Okay, uh, Davy, you picked this as well. Yeah, I've, <clears throat> I've, I've definitely heard this in like I used another TV show. I think I think it was um, maybe the last one of the last episodes of Mister Robot or something. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I've definitely heard it, but no, I think it, um, it's a perfect way to end the album and uh, send you on your way home. It's a, a, it's a great tune. Does exactly what it says on the tin and just closes the album perfectly. Okay, great, thank you. So we move on to our eighth track to to make it, and it's the first one from Amnesiac, and that is, I think, a unanimous choice. Yep, it is, and it is. <coughs> It is Pyramid Song, so let's give that a listen. He was a wonderful man. We (laughs) celebrate his life today in the service. Jumped in the river, what did I see? Okay, that was Pyramid Song. So we all wanted it on here. I think we're all fans of it. Davy, maybe start a few this time. Yeah, well, again, that was probably the first single they released since uh, 1997, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. Or 1998. Yeah, that's right. Um, remember seeing it, uh, I'd like to say live on top of the box, but obviously it wasn't. It was. <laughs> was it? It was, yeah. Um, so that's one of my memories of it, is the band. I think it got to number two. Uh, I'm sure. And they played it, which was unusual for them. They went on top of the pops to play it. And it's hilarious because you've got all these kind of teenagers standing around looking at the (laughs) band, not knowing what to do. It's like this song, well, can't dance to this. And then you've got the band themselves thinking it's hilarious. (laughs) So, yeah, they they did it on top of the pops, yeah. Ah, but was it it live or it dubbed? Which is the usual uh, case. I oh. can't remember that one, Davy. I, I no, normally it's always uh, dubbed, so they were just like pretending to sing along. But uh, no, that was uh, it's, a, it's like it's like such a good single to hear for the first time in what about four or five years, mm-hmm. and to be able to go out and get a B side. Yeah, that's right. Okay, Paul. Yeah, the song stand stood out for me. And I actually didn't realise it was a single, and that probably, obviously, 
it was probably more commercial, maybe. And it sounded a bit more like OK Computer period for me, like the piano, a bit like uh, I'm a police or something like that. Uh, and no, good, good song. Maybe the best Ros- song out there, two albums. OK. Roscoe? I, I didn't know it was a single year, but I probably had a bit of a strange choice for a, for, for a single, if I'm honest. Um, but the song itself, yeah, probably yeah, the strongest song on the album. And the uh, yeah, it starts off with the piano, and then obviously the strings, and then the band kick in towards the end, and the strings, mm. strings are beautiful, particularly right towards the end. Just uh, just kind of adds something to it. Um, yeah, beautiful song. Very strong. Yeah, agreed. I mean, I've always loved this song. I think the piano chords on it are just uh, sensational, as is Tom York's vocal on it. Uh, and I think when the, the strings and the drums kick in for the fl- first time, it's glorious. Uh, again, another very jazzy uh, sounding uh, song. Uh, but yeah, definitely a highlight from the two albums. Um, and here's a couple of interesting facts for you. Did you know that Tom York, um, he, when he wrote it, he based, based it on a song by the jazz player Charles Mingus called Freedom. Mm. Uh, and... Um, when Radiohead were performing it before they put it on the album, the song was initially known as Egyptian Song. Uh-huh. Which, uh, yeah, it's kind of got that Egyptian kind of feel to it, hasn't it? The, the chords and the, the orchestra, so that makes that makes sense. I suppose why the, the name, the Pyramid Song, I, I just think of Glastonbury. And I mm. feel as if that's maybe where the title came from. It's more uh, a, a sort of reference to Glastonbury, obviously clearly not. Um, no, no. no. Okay, the the next song that makes it um, is, and it wasn't unanimous, Uh, Paul didn't pick this one. Uh, This was, if I remember correctly, this was the second single from the album, and it is Knives Out. Darth Vader here, I think. I'm just thinking that. Luke. <laughs> I, either that or somebody's having a really good time listening to that song. Knives <laughs> <laughs> out. <laughs> so I'm actually going to start with... Uh, Paul, because you didn't pick it, and I'm really surprised. <laughs> Actually, it, it sounds a bit like a Radiohead that we knew before that. Which is why you I'm know, surprised I, you didn't pick it. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not, not too sure, to be as, a, as the honest truth. I think it was, I almost saw the two albums as one, and... Uh, I know this isn't answering the question, but I actually think this, uh, Amnesiac's a better album out of the two. Because it sounds more like traditional Radiohead. So that's my answer. <laughs> that was a very, very well dodged political response it's to the question. Answer. Yes, it was. Uh, Ross? Yeah, I've got to agree with you, Paul, actually. It's, um, it feels like more OK Computer, maybe. You know, yeah. um, and um, that's quite a bit, of, bit of pace to the song. I think the tone of it. I think if it was slowed down, it'd be like almost the ultimate depressive song. Um, but I think the pace of it probably keeps it from becoming that. But still, um, probably not my favourite on the album. Um, good, good enough song. Um, I think it was a, I think it was a single. <laughs> um, so it feels more like a single, but maybe not necessarily stronger song. No. Okay, thanks, Ross. Uh, Darth Vader. Sorry, Davy. <laughs> <laughs> I never heard anything that you said. <laughs> uh, knives out, Davy. What do you think? Yeah. So no, it was again. It was a really good single to 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 release as well. I had a, a great music video. I remember it. It's just like walking through a woods where it's like avant garde. Thing wolves and going on the background. It's uh, interesting. Was that like you tonight, Davy walking. <laughs> Junior walk tonight. Was that the same? <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. 
Is that no there there? Ah, right, ah, right. It's there, there. He's in a house, I think, in this. Aye. Like, he's in a house, we... Aye, can't mind. That, that is right, actually. <laughs> that, was, that, was a, that, that was a that's nice a commentary, song. Davey. You were going somewhere nice with that. <laughs> <laughs> and Ross had to spoil it. With, <laughs> Ross had to spoil it with facts. We'll, we'll cut around that. <laughs> <laughs> So tremendous music video. Okay. Uh, yeah, I first heard this when they played Glasgow Green 2004 Amnesiac was out and I thought it sounded incredible then. Still do love it. Uh, my favourite song in Amnesiac, I think, yes, uh, it would have fitted into that kind of okay computer time period. Uh, and for some reason, it always reminds me of the, the main theme to the Deer Hunter movie. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know why. Kavanagh, Kav- is it called Kavanagh? Kevin. Kevin? <laughs> yeah, yeah, Kevin. Oh, oh, is it not called Can? Or what's it called? Is it not? Is it a theme tune? Yeah, no. yeah. Theme tune from. Theme hey. tune from Deer Hunter? I think that's what it's called, yeah. <laughs> what's the name? It's Kevin. <laughs> I would just like to say, by the way, I've just put there there on YouTube, and he's walking through a forest. So, <laughs> through the Cavendish, though. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <clears throat> aye, there, there, he's walking through a forest. Not knives out. Uh, oh, I <laughs> s- <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Have <laughs> yeah, you been right. drinking? <laughs> are you are you taking some serious <laughs> medication for that cough, baby? That's what it, what call, Half a bottle cold. of cough syrup will do that. To me. <laughs> so, I tell you what, boys, there, there, the boy walked through the forest. I told you. <laughs> It's like, oh, yeah. 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 One of these days I'll come on to one of these things and don't do a big blooper. Oh, no. <laughs> no, okay. That's all right. I know. That's it. From the deer hunters called the Cavantina. So I was close. To the, Cavantina. 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 the Star Wars Cavantina. Cantina. It's like that. Cavantina, yeah. So it's oh, called very Cavantina. Very good. Oh, very good. Now, did you know, guys, uh, the song? It took 373 days to record. The band kept trying to rework the song before deciding it was fine the way it was. How many times? 373 days to record. All right. A year and a week. Obviously, um, obviously we'd we'd be doing it and leave it and come back to it and keep trying to change it, yeah. Yeah. I thought you meant they stayed in the recording studio. No. Well, I I, I hope not. (laughs) I hope not. Imagine, yeah, never left. <laughs> they never left for over a year. I know. That would be interesting. Uh, okay, next one, guys. Penultimate one for the album is, uh, and I think myself, Ross, and Paul picked it, it's Like Spinning Plates. All together now. <laughs> <laughs> Go on, give us a smile, Tom. Give us a smile. <laughs> Tom, Tom York. Go on, go on, Tommy boy. You come, York. <laughs> Spinning plates now. Uh, the individual who did not select this was Mr. Darth Vader himself, Davy Mellon. <laughs> uh, Davy, I think that's a brilliant song. Why did you not pick it, Davy? I like it at all, to be fair, but um, you make the rules. <laughs> I can't remember the word. <laughs> Davy, are you living in cloud cuckoo land? <laughs> you like it, but just ran out of time, yeah? 
I, I, that, that, that's the case, but I like it. It's got a quite ominous, ominous sound going all the way through it. It's like, <laughs> I like it. <laughs> My God, I thought I, I thought I put the I thought I put the song back on there. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was uncanny. Uh, yeah, uh, I love the song. I think it's got a strange beauty to it. Uh, I love the the background effects and vocals. Um, and it's got a great chorus as well. Great vocal. Uh, as I say, I love that line in the chorus. I'm living in cloud cuckoo land. Um, however, if you hear the live version, that is amazing. The live version is sensational, where it's just the vocal and piano. Uh, track that down. It's, it's worthy of your time. I'll give you a fact about it. Um, the, do you know that Tom York sang this backwards because he thought it sounded too uncomfortable the regular way? Uh, so the track was then reversed and added on, resulting in the lyrics being sung backwards and forwards, which is why it sounds a bit weird. But I like that. that that's, that's, that's pretty cool. I do like that. <laughs> Uh, Ross, you like this? I I do. I I mean, I think um, I remember um, it was a podcast or something, and Tom York was asked about kind of Radiohead and all that, and he said after um, pretty much uh, OK Computer in terms of they were going to do something different, and uh, and yet said that you know what records in particular. I don't know if you guys know if it's Sheffield the early nineties, pretty much a label really more for sort of experimental electronic music and he kind of said that that was a kind of the start you know listening to music listening to artists on that label and uh, to go into Kiddy and obviously Amnesia and you can kind of hear that in the start of the song things like uh, artists like Aphex Twin, Square Pusher and um, there's a few others and you can kind of hear that probably more so in this song than any other so you've kind of got that I think uh, it probably feels a bit more like a sort of Tommy Ock solo track I would say, um, no, so the stuff he'd done after that, uh, and I, I totally agree with yourself in terms of the live version. So the live version on that, I might be wrong, which is for me is one of the best live albums ever. Um, the live version is just amazing, I because it, it, it's com- completely different song. I, I feel probably the song on Am- the, the version on Amnesia is probably a bit buried. There's a there's a brilliant song there. It's probably not quite the the best version, but go live with the piano, and it's just terrific. terrific. All right, Paul. Yeah, yeah, good, good, uh, good music. And like Ross was saying about Sheffield, like quit. I was thinking, funnily enough, yesterday I was thinking quite a lot of good like bands have come out of Sheffield over the years and artists and stuff. Uh, so yeah, so the Phil Monty, they've come out there. That's right, the Phil Monty came out of there. Yeah, I was cock a hoop when they released that. Yeah, Def Leppard. Hope. Uh but the yeah, it's, it sounds a wee bit like Brian Eno as well. That sort of atmospheric in the background, and uh, like I say, for me, it doesn't feel like a lot of the songs don't sound like a band. They just sound kind of like musical pieces from an art show or something. And but maybe that's what they wanted to do. I don't know, but. Okay, uh, right, so let's move on to the final song that makes it on to Amnesiac Kid, and it is also the final song from Amnesiac, and it is Life in a Glass House. Cheer up, sleepy Tom. <laughs> of course I like I'm so happy singing. <laughs> Okay, that was Life in a Glass House. <laughs> so, I think, uh, Ross, you were the dissenter here. You were the only one that didn't pick it. Why not, Roscoe? Well, the question is, no way why I didn't pick it. Why did you see Muppets pick it? Oh, here we are. That's a cracking <laughs> Because <laughs> it uplifts my spirits, Ross. That's why. It's, nice. it's so uplifting <laughs> and so it just leaves me full of life. I, I've got to say... Uh, it's, it's quite uh, quite a jazz feel. I mean, that's probably more a jazz feel than probably any of the, the songs in the album. But yeah, a bit in the depressing side than um, just, just stronger songs on the album. I'm afraid the the ones I picked. Um, okay. So yeah, no, not one for me. 
you can't be right all the time, Ross. Um, so, Paul. <laughs> oh, is Davey falling asleep? Star, <laughs> are you there? Star, I'm here, I. I'm sure it said Paul, though. <laughs> I know, but it, oh, I can hear what I said. Paul was. <laughs> uh, yeah, well. Make you fall asleep. But, uh... right, well, Paul, Paul, you give us your thoughts on it. Okay. Actually, quite. Quite like I just I I just like the sort of can you imagine like in an old jazz club and mm-hmm. somebody's at the piano and somebody's smoking and the guy's got like a fedora hat on <laughs> not one of your dirty movies not one of, not like that but uh, just seems like something these or something so it's just I think it's quite good it's different yeah agreed uh, did he. I really like it just because of the, the, the jazz notes in it. Um, like I said, it's kind of like a, one of these New Orleans street funeral yeah. <laughs> dirges that yeah. when, uh, um, was what they were aiming for. And like, like, I think uh, they got. They yeah, yeah. Like, like that, yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, a good show. Like yeah. Oh, no, I really like it for that reason. And it's uh, the last couple of minutes of it are brilliant. Yeah, agreed. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's another really jazzy song. I love the the trumpets and the clarinet on it. It's a great album closer. And uh, yeah, I agree with you guys. I think it's nice to hear a track on the album, which does sound deliberately old fashioned. Um, and the there's a funny story with it, which I'll try and uh, not, not, not uh, give the whole story. I'll try and abbreviate it. But in effect, they, they, they approached, they were having trouble finishing the song and Johnny Greenwood from the band had approached jazz trumpeter uh, Humphrey Littleton and asked him to come in and perform in it. And uh, he did come in and I think this was maybe uh, the norm for Radiohead at the time. They would record and record and then record. Uh, so anyway, uh, so I turned up with my band and we just blew for seven hours with a couple of tea breaks and every now and then Radiohead disappeared into the control room. We saw them waving their arms about and in the end, my ch- were sagging. And I said, genuinely, I think this is it. We've got it. Tom <laughs> had spent quite a lot of time standing on his head in a little booth <laughs> or at least he went into positions of meditation and he said to me, I think so. We'll have something to eat and then do some more. And I said, no, we will not. <laughs> and that was that. So, uh, but yeah, great song. So that means we have our 11 tracks for Amnesiac Kid and they are Everything in Its Right Place, The National Anthem, How to Disappear Completely, Optimistic, Idiotech, Morning Bell, Motion Picture Soundtrack, Pyramid Song, Knives Out, Light Spinning Plates and Life in a Glass House. So in a moment, we'll go on to briefly talk about the songs that didn't make it. Uh, but before that, uh, just to share with you, I had put a poll on the Radiohead fans page Facebook group uh, earlier this week, and I asked them to pick their favourite song across the two albums. And there was an overwhelming winner. So I'm going to go around each of you. I'm going to ask you to have a guess at which song you think was the most popular with Radiohead fans. So, Davey, I'll start with you. Um, National Anthem. Okay. Ross? Everything in its right, in its right place. That's easy for you to say, Ross. <laughs> Come on. And, <laughs> and Paul? <laughs> uh, pyramid Song. You guys are so good that, uh, yeah, all wrong. <laughs> um... The winner was How to Disappear Completely, which had more than double the votes of the second place song, which was Idiotech. Uh, Your favourite, Ross. Uh, Third was Pyramid Song, fourth was Everything in Its Right Place, and fifth was National Anthem. So you weren't too far away, were you? (laughs) You picked third through to fifth there. So uh, thank you to everyone on the Radiohead fans page who voted. 
Uh, I think that there was nearly, yeah, well over 200, 200 boats there, um, maybe approaching 300. So, yeah, thank you very much for that. That was great. So, guys, let's turn our attention to very briefly talk about the songs that uh, nearly or had no chance of making it on. And the, the, I, was going to, I was trying to be polite about it, but some of them were just not going to make it no. whatsoever. And the first one is the title track of Kiddy, which was called Kiddy. And uh, I will just give that a, a brief play just now because I have to. Okay, so that was uh, Kid A. And actually, before we talk about it, guys, I actually just want to check if anyone on the Radiohead uh, Facebook page there had picked that. Oh, my God. Three people did. Mm. Wow. Okay, fair play. Uh, so, um, Davey, I'm going to start with you. Uh, just want to give us some brief thoughts on that song. Well, very loosely call it a song. Yeah, it's like a, a wee brief interlude between songs. Uh, I don't mind it, to be fair. It's kind of grown off on me from listening to it all those years ago many times, but nah, it's, it doesn't serve to be on this. The cut, but nah, it's interesting. Interesting. It's an interesting song. Davy, it's crap. <laughs> no. It's a total nothing song. It's complete oral wallpaper. It's like something I'd hear in the background of a yoga class. <laughs> Should never have been on the album, let alone its title track, and it's not even good enough for a B-side. I'm not a fan of it, can you tell? <laughs> I, I would always skip this when I played the CD. It's just such a waste of time. Five minutes of your life, you're never getting back. Um, did you know that the actually the Kid A um, was the name of one of the settings on one of the se uh, sequencers the band were using when they were making the album? That's where that comes from. Uh, so me and Davey are disagreeing on that. Uh, Ross and Paul, get any thoughts on Kid A? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. A bit of, bit of a fellow experimental song, but just doesn't really work. Yeah, it doesn't really, yeah, it doesn't really do it for me, I have to say. Yeah, to be honest, <laughs> well, I haven't already said. On <laughs> to the next song. One person in this group did vote for it, which, <laughs> which, okay, which, which they're going to really regret. Um, so let's play it. Let's just play it. It's Tree Fingers. <laughs> Sounds good already. It's instrumental, wasn't it? You are stepping into the warm ocean. <laughs> the sun is shining in the sky. You see? The acid is starting to kick in now. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Your medication is working. Michael. <laughs> Michael, you, you are your successful. medication, Michael. <laughs> Great success is coming your way. <laughs> That was me, do <laughs> no, no, it was actually three fingers. And, um, well, let's go to Paul because you picked this. Paul, explain yourself. I just thought it was uh, a nice wee interlude, just a nice wee <laughs> Alec peaceful <Klinger>. ambient sounds. <laughs> it, didn't have, <laughs> it didn't have uh, depressing vocals, so. So yeah, no, I just thought it was quite a nice wee, it reminded me of, was there not an R.E.M. song on 
Did they don't not bring Ari Emin right to it. Do not bring Ari Emin to it. Automatic for the people. Yeah, or and just justify your selection. People, did they not have an instrumental song? Yeah, right? but, they were, but they were good. Airport man. Country feedback. <laughs> <laughs> the difference is Ari Emin instrumentals were good. Oh, yeah. airport, air, airport man, no, I'll give you that one. <laughs> It's a New Orleans, a New Orleans instrumental. Yeah. Oh so, yeah, that's great. That's good. Uh, it's good but, there, but there's 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 good palate cleansers and there's tree fingers. Yes, no, definitely. Fish fingers. It's, yeah. well, right, well, a couple of fish Captain, fingers would be Captain lovely. Yeah. Yeah. Um it's just back to more electronic Minecraft computer game background music doodling. Yeah. It's four minutes and nothing. Just think of that. You, you waited three years to get this. Mm. Waited three years after OK Computer, and you're getting tree fingers. Oh, do you not think they're taking themselves a bit too seriously, though? <laughs> like these albums, like they're just being like anti-commercial for for the sake for commercial, a, you know, just to be. It, I suppose with that though, they, 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 there's, there, there is some terrific music in, the, in these two albums. So they've they experimented. Some of it's no work, but when it has worked, it's up there with some of their best stuff, so aye, I think you just have to take it roughly and smooth. I think mm-hmm. uh, this is a great example of that, isn't it? Well, Paul, you're not oh, you're not alone, good. Paul. Uh, two people in the REM poll did vote for Tree Fingers. The REM poll, <laughs> that's the REM. <laughs> <Are you> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> even the, even REM fans like it. See, I'm not that. I'm not alone. Oh, well, I, 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 yeah, the best track from Automatic for the people, Tree Fingers. <laughs> <laughs> the Radiohead uh, poll, I should Three say. Finger. <laughs> He's a He's man. man. All right, the next one, which never got any votes from anyone, was in Limbo. Something, give it a, a play. <laughs> Okay, that was in Limbo, so I'll maybe kick us off on this one. Um, I actually think this is a good song, and it was very unlucky to, to miss out. And uh, Limbo is a religious word, meaning a place in the afterlife between heaven and hell. Um, and the original title of the song was Lost at Sea. So, yeah, I think it's unlucky to miss out. Uh, Ross, do you agree? I did. That was on. So the two songs I had on that didn't make it uh, that were on my short list was in uh, How to Disappear Completely and then Limbo. So it, it was quite close. Uh, it probably feels more a sort of a, it's a jam. It doesn't quite get going. I mean, it, it, but it's, it's a decent enough song. I think that's it. I think that's fairly average. Okay. Nothing much else to say. Okay. Uh, Davey and Paul, anything to say? Yeah, I really liked it actually. Um, yeah, one of it's unfortunate not to get my um album, but um, no, it's like in between the uh, tree, uh, not tree, uh, optimistic and mm. idiotic. Yeah, I think the end of optimistic segues right right into this, but you get the wee guitar bit at the start. So I really like it. Yeah, okay, thank you for that. Uh, another song that didn't make it and nobody voted for this was, thank God, was Packed Like Sardines in a Crushed Tin Box. Let's hear it. <laughs> you got the pots and pans with it? <laughs> now, do you know what? They actually are pots and pans. Oh, yeah. Really? They are, yeah. I just read that today. Yeah, that's, that's, <laughs> he did actually play pots and pans. <laughs> I'm, I'm in my kitchen. You know what? This actually sounds like um, one of the songs on Tom York's soul album. Yeah. Yeah. That's actually. Um, so they've song Black Swan. Black Swan sounds okay. like this. Okay, so pack like sardines. Uh, anybody want to say anything about the song? 
I like it. I do like it. Um, but it's uh, probably be better off as a B side. <laughs> uh, a B side, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, this one only got three votes on the Radiohead poll. Um, I know for me, it's uh, obviously the first track on uh, Amnesiac, and I actually remember playing it for the first time. And I just remember my optimism for that album almost <laughs> evaporating immediately when I heard it. Just like, oh, here we go again. I, I think personally, I think it's a, a poor song, and I would always skip it and just go straight to Pyramid song. Um, poor song this, to start, eh? Poor song uh, to start. Yeah, yeah not, not, a good choice. not a good no, choice. No, not at all. Um, apparently, the song was inspired by the city of Panis, where drivers, who are the sardines, <laughs> ride around in little cars, which are like tin boxes. All right. There we go. So that is Pack Like Sardines. Uh, the next one, which was track four, if I remember, I uh, know track three, sorry, on Amnesiac, was um, Pulp Pool Revolving Doors. So let's uh, give a listen to that. Uh, it's another one, though, that nobody voted for, but let's give it a, a listen. Okay, that's pool, pool, revolving doors. Um, Davy. Yep, that was the first song after Tree Fingers to get cut from the album. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do the easy cuts first, right? That's yeah. definitely gone. See you later. Bye. I, I we'll think the ra- I think the Radiohead poll maybe sums it up. One vote. Ah, I mean, you mean expect that? Yeah. This I wasn't is... Paul that voted on it, no? <laughs> <laughs> I think it should have been a single, to be fair. It's got that commercial quality. Now, if you want to talk commercial, seriously, yeah, at least that is a single. You've been ready, I wouldn't do that. It's awful. It, it's it's crap. It, I mean, uh, genuinely, there's nothing about that I like. Uh, I always skipped it. It's just a waste of five minutes of your life listening to it. Five and minutes. Five minutes, yeah. And, and again, to give you a context, remember listening to this album for the first time, and I, and I love Radiohead, and you've had, by this point, Pack Like Sardines, <laughs> rubbish, <laughs> Pyramid Song, brilliant, then you get Polk Pool, and it's rubbish, and you're thinking, what are you doing? <laughs> what are you doing to me, Radiohead? <laughs> this, oh. this, re- this reminds me of uh, Feral on King of Limbs, the same thing. It's like, it's not even a, it's not even a song, it's not a piece of music, it's just something. It's, it's probably just mediocre, isn't it? That's what it is, it's mediocre, and, and, the, and the people will be so much better. I don't yeah. mind Feral, actually, to be fair. Yeah, yeah. yeah I'm the same, actually, David, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, don't mind Feral. I don't mind Feral either. <laughs> it's certainly not. You're talking about Will Feral, that? <laughs> <laughs> That's a fair Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Aye, Feral is lovely. Nice lad. <laughs> okay, let's move on to the next one that didn't make it, uh, but actually me and Ross did want it. And and for me, this is something which I really need to take uh, Davy and Paul to task over because this is criminal. This is not on Amnesiac Kid. So we'll play it first, and it is You and Whose Army. Cherry one. 
The guy's in pain. Put him out his misery. <laughs> yeah, I can see why you want it on there, Steve. <laughs> I just, I, I love just its optimism. The second half, the second half of the song is good, though. Second oh, half yeah, of the song is second, brilliant. Yeah. It is absolutely If you can make, you can make yeah. it to there. Yeah. Uh, the band coming in, it's just tremendous. Oh, yeah. awesome. I think it's a brilliant song. But anyway, that was You and Whose Army. Ross, you were on. Uh, so did I. What do you like about You and Whose Army? Uh, well, I suppose it's a bit depressing to start off with. It almost feels as if it's like uh, his vocals like something out the 1920s. I don't know. I just feel uh, that's what when I, when mm-hmm. I hear the song. I kind of feel yep. as if it's a, bit, uh, feel a, different, a long lost era. Uh, and, then, and then the drums kick in, the drum, bass, piano. And just the, the and it, yeah, just just terrific, terrific. So, uh, but probably that's only two halves. It's, and then maybe it's a first half is is what puts people off, which you can understand. Well, this yeah. this was actually the sixth most popular choice <coughs> on the Radiohead poll, so it's obviously yeah. uh, popular with fans. Um, for me, yeah, I'm gutted whenever I got that on to Amnesiac Kid. Um, I think it's a brilliant song, one of the highlights across Kid A and Amnesiac. It's another jazzy song. I like. As you say, I like the filtered vocal effect at the beginning, which I found out today was done by, I think they had uh, egg boxes, and they put that around the microphone to give it that effect. Um, So it's like a filtered vocal. Uh, But yeah, I I, I love it from the beginning. I love that simple production and the way it builds when all the band kicks in. It's a superb song. Uh, And actually, Tom York wrote about the disillusionment with Tony Blair's Labour government. And he said that the song is ultimately about someone who's elected into power by people who then blatantly betray them, just like Blair did. There you go. Mm -hmm. Uh, So, Paul and Davey, you didn't uh, choose it. What's wrong with you? Um, Nothing's wrong with me. I actually really (laughs) like it. (laughs) I like like what it stands for, uh, politicians stabbing you in the back like Blair did. Um, It was actually the last song to... It was the last Hope you song. reported them to the police, David. It's <laughs> not, even when he's the Prime Minister, he can't do that. Ah, well, he sent my wee bird into a war zone so he can fuck. Yeah. Ride in the cowboy. <laughs> Okay, guys, that was I Might Be Wrong. Who wants to talk about this one? Yeah, what's wrong with you guys not picking it? I picked it, Davey. So me excellent, and you. excellent. Oh, saucer of milk for Davy Mellon. <laughs> <laughs> so to ask uh, me your own question, Steve, what is wrong with you? What is wrong with me? Right, <laughs> well, I'll tell you what is wrong with me for this song. Um, I actually used to quite like this song, uh, but... I think as time's gone by, I just think it's a bit of a guitar song that doesn't go anywhere for me. I just find it dull. And we again tend to skip it now. <laughs> um, so the song is about a crisis point in Tom York's life. Uh, and the singer's troubles were partly caused by the baggage of past relationships and coincided with an instant where York was strolling on a beach, looked back and spotted an apparition in his house. And it turned out to be Davy stealing his stuff. <laughs> uh, so yeah, you, well, you guys like it. What do you guys like about it? I think it's it's a well, a bit of an antidote to the, the, the experimental guff that doesn't go anywhere. I think it's uh it's got a brilliant guitar riff at the start, um, and it's got I think it, I've got my notes here. I think there's a sort of a breakdown around four minutes. Mm-hmm. Pretty yep. good as well. Um, yeah, it's just a tune that just ambles along and there's a good like the, the version on, on the I Make Your Old Live album is really good as well. I just love mm-hmm. the guitar. It's probably the guitar riff that I love more than anything else, but it's probably just as much to do with Cosby some of the other stuff that's on there. Um and it feels more like Radiohead the band. So yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh well the the next one <clears throat> which uh missed out it was the amnesiac version of Morning Bell. So that 
was the amnesiac version of Morning Bell. And the only person to want that wasn't there was, <laughs> mid- was, was Mr. Three Fingers himself. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so Paul, why did you want? Why did you want this? Who spent about the last hour of seeing how depressing Radio Radar? <laughs> I, <know. laughs> I just, I it just like it because. <laughs> it, it wakes me up in the morning it's like my morning bell my alarm bell and it wakes me up uh, no I think it's it's good because it's got a bit of a tune that most of the songs don't really have uh, so yeah uh, it's it's a nice use of the melancholy that Tom York Tom York Tom York <laughs> Tom York <laughs> nice chocolate yeah. maker <laughs> so it's a travesty he didn't pick that ah oh, come on <laughs> We did not need a second version of uh, the song When the Kid A One Is Better. It would have been a good B-side, I'll give you that. Mm-hmm. But yeah, we, we didn't need another version. I think the thinking behind it was um, the Beatles doing three different versions of Revolution. On, uh, uh, well, yeah, because it's, it's comparable in quality of that song, isn't it? <laughs> That's right. And uh-huh. Yeah. Okay, um, the penultimate one, which didn't make it, was... And did anyone actually vote for this one? Uh, <laughs> another one from Paul here, and it's, <laughs> it's dollars and cents. <laughs> Bucks and dimes. We can use... Be constructive. Uh, Paul, you pick this. I like the <laughs> instrumentation behind the song. It's quite a funky song, isn't it? It's quite, it's yeah. quite a wee bit of funkiness to it, I would say. Mm. Yeah. Very playful. I don't mind yeah. it, but it's just not yeah, it anywhere near a 50 minute cut. <laughs> yeah, I'm with my same, yeah, agree. It's, uh, one the, strong, it's one of the stronger songs on Amnesia mm-hmm, that didn't, didn't make it on. Yeah, I agree. Um, the Radiohead uh, poll there was uh, was with you, Paul, with, with you, Paul, in this selection. Quite right. Well, uh, yes, right. one yeah, person voted stuff. for it. <laughs> <laughs> one person. <laughs> was it Paul again? <laughs> yeah, Paul, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> actually, I actually think this is uh, it's a good song, good feel. Station. Yeah, I think it's decent. Uh, the song was about the, the policies of world banks and corporations and how it's affecting the developing world. And it was um, uh, all to do with Naomi Klein's 2000 anti-globalisation book, No Logo. Any of you guys read that? No. no. Yeah, I've read it. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I was going to say, that would be a step up from your Mr. Men book, <laughs> Don't knock the Mr. Men books, they're good. <laughs> Mr. Tree Fingers, isn't it? Yeah. I, <laughs> Mr. Tree Fingers, yeah. What's Mr. Tree Fingers doing today? He's listening to Tom York. <laughs> oh, Mr. Tree Fingers is so sad. He's listening yes. to Radiohead's latest album. <laughs> he was Mr. Happy, now he's Mr. Sad. <laughs> All right, well, the last song. Have you read it, Steve? Uh, no logo. I've not. It's one of those books where you you think, oh, I'll get around to reading that one of these years. But no, I've not. Uh, I've heard it's excellent, no. Mm. Um, but yeah, I've not. I have to say, I have not. Uh, okay, the last song which uh, didn't make it and was selected by none of us, uh, and I'm actually surprised Paul didn't pick it. <laughs> <laughs> is <laughs> is hunting bears. Hunting bears, hunting bears. <laughs> so <going> hunting bears. <laughs> Christ. 
Um, so, anybody had considered putting that one on their cut? No concern it, but I quite like the guitar. I, I like the guitar on it. I like the guitar sound in the riff. Mm. But it's just maybe it could do a song <coughs> round about it, maybe. A bit like I might be wrong. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I, I, I quite like the, the riff, but nah, nowhere near a final cut. I think I was uh, mentioning it to you maybe yesterday or the other day, Steve. Um, I remember being in the Edinburgh Film Festival mm. about 15 years ago or something like that. And they had this Iranian film on that I was going to see, and it was just this policeman walking through some barren desert or landscape in Tehran. And then all of a sudden, this song came on. I was like, What's going on here? <laughs> hunting bears, hunting bears. So, so Davey, it wasn't soundtracking a happy family holiday in Florida, no? <laughs> no, no. I, I, was really, I really quite enjoyed it when it came on. I went, oh, I know that song. It's, it's probably best to watch with that film. But... <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a funny... It, it, I know we were kind of joking earlier on about the comparison between some of the REM instrumentals, the short instrumentals, and some of the Radiohead ones here. And I think this is a good example. See if this was just a, the, the, the solitary instrumental type song in the album, then it would be fine if it was surrounded by what I'd call proper songs, <clears throat> proper good songs. Then you'd go, oh, okay, it's a nice little palate cleanser. But because I think it's 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 a Apache album, you you can't get away with putting this on here again. It's just a nothing song that you would skip. Uh, although, yeah, I agree <coughs> the, the, the 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 actual guitar and it's nice. I think it's only Tom York that plays in it. I think it's a electric guitar and a sequenced bass. Um, but but yeah, it's, it's again, it's one you would normally skip, wouldn't you? I think like it's kind of like. Um... Um, Johnny Greenwood like practicing for when he was going to do film scores. Like, yeah, there will yeah. be blood and all, all that. Yeah, yeah. So guys, Which that, are shooting yeah. to films and not a uh, commercial pop album. Mm, yeah, <laughs> well, exactly. So guys, we've got our songs that have made it. We've talked about the songs that have not. Uh, before we finish up, I think it would be great to share with the listeners what your own individual cuts of the album are. So Ross, can we maybe go to you first? Okay, look. Yeah, so the first track was National mm. Anthem. Again, mentioned it earlier, just uh, it's got a big sort of intro, which I always quite like at the start of, a, start of an album. So National Album, eh, National Album. <laughs> <laughs> national, <laughs> national Album Week. That, that's what I put on the WhatsApp. My name is picked me up on it. So I put the National <laughs> Album, but I meant the National Anthem. So National Anthem, eh, track two, like spinning plates. Track three, everything in its right place. Track four, Knives Out. Track five, You and Who's Army, that'd be side one. Side two, uh, Optimistic. Um, track six, track seven, I Might Be Wrong. Track eight, Morning Bell, Kiddy version, not superior. Track nine, Pyramid Song. And track ten, the best song of the lot, Idiotic. Okay, thanks, Ross. Uh, Davey? Uh, yep, so I kicked it off with uh, Everyone in the Right Place because I think that's a great opening song. Um, it fits in perfectly there. Um, after that, um, Pyramid Song, Track 3, Knives Out, uh, How to Disappear Completely, and to end the first time, we'd have the National Anthem. And then to open up the second side, uh, with that really good drift would be I Might Be Wrong, um, followed by Optimistic and Idiotic, and finishing up the last two songs, um, they're both perfect album closers, but one of them had to come first. So I went with the uh, Life in a Glass House and finished off with Motion Picture Soundtrack. Okay, thanks for that. Paul? <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> everybody laughs when it comes up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, start off with the National Anthem, because I, I believe that's the way the album should have started off the Kiddy album. And then Pyramid Song. And then How to Disappear Completely. Uh, a favourite of yours, Life in a Glass House. That would be the fourth track. And then maybe my favourite, Tree Fingers, track number five. <laughs> <laughs> and then just to finish off, side one on a real high optimistic would be that, that song. And then side two, I'd have Morning Bell, 
And then after that, I'd have morning bell again with amnesia. Uh, and then <clears throat> dollars and cents, like spinning plates. And then finish off the album, bang on 50 minutes, 11 songs, with, with motion picture soundtrack, because I think it's quite atmospheric and it's a nice way to, to end the album. Okay, so, yeah. thank you for that. Uh, for mine, uh, I would also start with everything in its right place, uh, similar to, to Baby. Think it's a good opener, then uh, kick it up a gear with the national <clears throat> anthem before slowing it down without it disappear completely. Bring the tempo back up again with video tech uh, before going into morning bell. And I think that would probably take me to the end of side one. Kicking off side two with a nice little opener of motion picture soundtrack before getting a bit more serious again with Pyramid Song. Then into You and His Army, Knives Out, Light Spinning Plates and Life in the Glass House. So very much with mine, it's following the running order on both albums, but obviously just omitting the songs that I didn't, didn't want. But yeah, that comes in. Uh, 11 songs and 50 minutes. So, guys, we're talking about the Amnesiac Kids. What are we thinking? Is it a better album than the two that were released separately? Ross? Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, I think it's definitely stronger Amnesiac and slightly stronger than uh, Kiddy. Okay. Uh, Paul? Is our Amnesiac Kid better than the two separate albums? I think so, yeah. I would say so. Taking the best out of uh, two two albums. Okay. So, <clears throat> yeah, I would say. But I have to say, I am aware as well, like you guys know the album's better than me. So, obviously, I'm, I'm going to be different. But it's not stuff I would listen to a lot, to be honest. There's a few tracks I would, but... The majority, uh, I don't think, would really interest me. Okay. Uh, Davey? Yeah, so it's, I would say it's definitely a far better than uh, Amnesiac. Um, if we are able to add on another couple of songs to my cut, I would say it would be better than both of them. Actually, it would be outstanding. Um, I think it needs an extra two songs to make it a proper five-star. Okay. Yeah, we can uh, We can add in Who's the Army and... Yep. Maybe we'll get I two might fingers wrong. on there and it's a five-star classic. <laughs> 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 Okay, gentlemen, thank you for your time this evening. Um, so, you can contact us via our Facebook group, Joint Access to Exclusive Podcast Episodes and Ranking Videos. You can email us at trimthemusicfat at gmail.com and leave us voicemail via Anchor. Uh, let us know which albums you'd like us to cover in the future. Uh, you can listen to our show on all major podcast providers, including Apple, Google, and Spotify. Uh, we have, I think, how many podcasts are we up to now, Paul? I think we're... Uh, 30 odd. We're into the 30s, yeah. yeah. So uh, check out uh, all of them via Anchor or on our uh, our website, which is www.trimmingmusicalfat.com. Kong? <laughs> Kong? King, King Kong. <laughs> Dot King Kong. www.trimmingmusicalfat.com King Kong. Bottom James Dot King Dong. King Dong. <laughs> that's that's an entirely different website. <laughs> um, I might be wrong, but I think I hear the morning bell telling us to disappear completely. Until next time, keep trimming. Created a sense of ordinary, ordinary is. I can't even say it. Do you want to take it again? Created a sense of ordinary is. Hello. Created a sense of ordinariness. And. <laughs> Ordinariness. I love it. I love it.